Hi boys and girls, welcome back to your next lesson in physics. Last lesson we looked at atoms and their structure. This lesson we're looking at the history of the atom. But to start us off, please have a go at these questions, some of which are to do with last lesson's work. Some of the questions are to do with uh, a little bit further back when we were still at school. Just to, uh, just to make sure you don't forget the, uh, the stuff at the beginning of our subject. Pause the video. Have a go at these six questions, and there's a challenge question that I'd like to have a go at if you feel confident to do so. Pause the video, and we'll go through the answers next. Okay. First question was about equation that links kinetic energy, mass, and velocity. From our energy topic, kinetic energy equals half times mass times velocity squared, Ke, or Ek, sorry, equals half mv squared. Question two was a gravitational potential energy question. And again, this equation was one that you have to remember from the energy topic. The kinetic energy one was also one you have to remember. They're not given to you, but they definitely will come up in your exam. Question two, uh, gravitational potential energy equals mass times gravitational field strength times height. You'll notice in this one that the mass m is given as grams, 200 grams. But we need to convert that into kilograms. So 200 grams as kilograms is 0 0.2. Always remember that step. Grams have to be converted into kilograms. 0 0.2 times 9.8, which is the gravitational field strength on Earth, times the height, which is 4.5 meters, and that gives us a value of 8.82 joules. Energy is measured in joules. Question three was a density uh, question, and it was to do with how you'd find it, so the method, quick method. Cubes are regular shapes, so first we need to find the mass um, by weighing it on the scales. I've said in grams there, and you'll see why in a second. Normally we measure in kilograms the mass. So find the mass by weighing it on scales. Calculate the volume of the regular shape cube. We know the volume of a cube is length times width times height. It's a cube, so all of the sides are 15 centimeters. And another one there, we normally measure in meters. But in this case, we're doing grams per centimeter cubed because that gives us the same ratio as kilograms per meter cubed. So density could either be grams per centimeter cubed or kilograms per meter cubed. In this case, we've already got our thing in centimeters. Therefore, we can find the mass of the cube in grams. So we've got mass, we've got the volume. Density equals mass divided by volume. We don't know the mass, but this was just a method. Question four. Voltmeter. Potential difference is measured using a voltmeter, which is always placed in parallel across the thing that we're interested in. Protons are positive. Electrons are negative. Neutrons have no charge. They're neutral. These are three subatomic particles. The mass number tells you the number of protons and neutrons inside the nucleus of the atom. The mass number is always the bigger, the massive number. And the challenge question was, how would you be able to tell by looking at the mass number and atomic number if you have an isotope and a different element? Well, we know that isotopes have different numbers of neutrons, same numbers of protons. Because it's the same element, the atomic number stays the same, the mass number changes. Each element also has a specific number of protons, so a specific atomic number. Different elements have different numbers of protons, they'll have different atomic numbers. Have a go through your answers, correct any that are not right, and we'll move on to our lesson. So we're looking at the history of the atom. And we'll be going through all of these facts from your fact book in a lot more detail. Today's lesson is um, a lot about fact finding 
and getting information about how we came up with the idea of the model of the atom that we sit at the moment. It was a bit of a journey. So you'll need a pen and paper and you'll be able to, you'll be needing to take uh, a few notes in this lesson, please. So we mentioned the model of the atom. So what does a model actually mean? That's a definition of a model. Please copy this down. It's an idea that we use uh, to explain what we see from our observations of experiments. We usually use them because they're a simplified way to tell us what's happening in the real world. The thing with models is that over time, new evidence comes out. We might do more experiments, or we might have better technology. That then gives us new observations, which don't quite match with the model that we currently have. In that case, the model has to be discarded and we have to come up with a new model to represent using our new observations from our new experiments. So models are constantly changing. So the history of the atom went through similar changes of models. We've always had this idea of wanting to know what the stuff around us is made up of. Again, we had really old history, uh, historic models of the atom. As new evidence, new technologies uh, progressed, those models kept getting refined, old ones thrown out, new ones to replace them. So starting at the beginning, Democritus, he was an ancient Greek philosopher, and we're talking 400 BC. And he thought to himself, if I get an object and I repeatedly keep cutting it in half, over and over again. So I cut it in half, and then I cut that in half, and I cut that half in half, and so on. Will there be a point where I cannot cut anything any smaller? And his idea was, there will be a point. The smallest point will be called an atom. They're invisible. They're indestructible. This is what he thought. They can't be cut anymore. Atom is the smallest thing possible. He thought all atoms are solid and they are the smallest thing available. At each of these slides, I'd like you to pause them and copy down as much information as you'd like. We're gonna create a timeline later on with the information on it. So that was Democritus, and his idea stood for a few thousand years. Until in 1808, John Dalton revisited Democritus's idea. He was an English chemist. And he agreed with this idea that atoms um, were solids, but his idea was the first to come up with atomic theory. He stated that atoms like, like snooker balls, billiard balls, or pool balls, they're tiny, they're invisible, and they're indivisible. What that means is you can't go any smaller than them. He said atoms of one element are all the same. Different elements or atoms of a different element, will be different. So all elements are the same type of atoms, but different elements will have different types of atoms. And he thought of the idea of compounds being formed by combining atoms. As I mentioned before, pause the video at any of these and get as much information as you can. In 1897, J.J. Thompson was the first person to discover electrons. So he was the first person to discover that atoms are actually not the smallest thing. There are parts of atoms, subatomic particles, that are even smaller than an atom. So he disproved Democritus and John Dalton, and the model of the atom changed, because the new evidence of electrons meant that the old atom no longer fit. He thought from his experiments that an atom was like a plum pudding, Back in the days, the word plum represented raisins. So if you can imagine a pudding with raisins dotted throughout it, that's the kind of idea model he used. He said that the pudding part of it, the whole sort of bready part, represented the spherical um, atom with positive charge all throughout it. And he said the electrons were dotted throughout this pudding, a bit like raisins dotted throughout, um, sorry, the electrons were dotted throughout the sphere, a bit like raisins dotted throughout a pudding. And we call this the plum pudding model. There's a little diagram of it there if you want to copy that out and any other information also. Ernest Rutherford, 
worked with J.J. Thompson and he came up with this idea that he wanted to prove uh, the plum pudding model. So he did this famous alpha scattering gold foil experiment. And he was the first person to prove that in fact there is no spherical sphere and charge all throughout, but atoms actually have a nucleus. So he was the first person to think about the nuclear model of the atom, nucleus. He fired tiny alpha particles at gold foil and he was expecting to see them bent everywhere, but in fact he saw different observations. And from this he disproved the plum pudding model and he came up with his own model, the nuclear model. And this is what he got. So pause this, get the information you want, and we're going to look at his experiment in a bit more detail. So on the top left hand, we've got a, uh, a diagram showing his apparatus. He had an emitter which shot out alpha particles. He then had uh, a detecting screen all around, a gold foil in the middle, and wherever the alpha particles hit the detecting screen, they'd leave a little mark so he knew where they'd hit. What he saw was the following. Now this table is very, very important. This table summarizes his observations. He did this experiment a hundred thousand times just to make sure that it was absolutely correct and the data was valid. So what he saw was most alpha particles went straight through. Now on the bottom you'll see a little diagram depicting um, an atom and alpha particles going through the atom. So A on the diagram and A in the table represent most of the alpha particles going straight through without being changed. This led to the conclusion that almost all of the atom is empty space. B is where he noticed some of the alpha particles were slightly deflected, slightly thrown off course, slightly bent. This meant that there must be a positive charge not all throughout the atom, but just concentrated in one area. Because alpha particles are positive, this positive part of the atom must repel, because positives and positives repel, they push each other apart. He also noticed very, very, very few alpha particles are bouncing back. This meant that there must be a very dense, tiny, tiny central nucleus part, which when the alpha particles hit them, can't go through and they bounce back. This table is very important. Please copy this out. Niels Bohr built on this idea, and he was the first person to come up with the idea that electrons actually orbited the nucleus in certain energy levels. And he built on Rutherford's idea, and he said that when these electrons, have, which have a distinct, they, only, they can only fit in certain shells in certain orbits, when they absorb rad electromagnetic radiation, they move up an energy level. When they give out electromagnetic radiation, they move down an energy level, they move down shells. That is important information also. James Chadwick was then the first person to prove that neutrons existed. Scientists have always found that when they found the mass of an atom, the number of protons, the mass of the protons, didn't quite match up to the total mass of the atom. So they knew there was something missing, there was something else in the atom giving the mass. So his experiments proved that neutral neutrons in the nucleus, na, 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 neutrons, which are neutral in the nucleus, had the same mass as protons, and that then gave the total mass of the atom. This is a summary of that. You can pause the video at any moment and get any extra information down. Could you please create a timeline of this model starting from the beginning all the way through to what we have right now? At the end you'll notice Urban Schrodinger, that's our current-ish model we've, we've built on that. As new evidence comes out, we might even have to change our model again. Pause the video, have a go at these exam questions, and the answers are coming up in just a second. Please check your answers, correct them, and we'll catch up next lesson. Thanks, guys.